worked. Okay. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. We are Pulses by Dre. I'm David. I'm Rena. I'm Alexia. So for some background behind our name, um, our first initials spell out Dre, like Beats by Dre, but Raiders emit pulses, so we decided to call ourselves Pulses by Dre. And as you can see, we have our name spelled out with Radar. Okay, so in today's topic, we'll be talking about Doppler. So through this presentation, we'll go over what exactly Doppler is, some modern day applications, and as well as some experiments we conducted over the past two weeks. So to understand our presentation uh, and all of our experiments, first we need to understand what the Doppler shift or the Doppler effect is. Even though some of you probably haven't heard of it, you've all seen it uh, or heard it. Uh, whenever a car zooms past you and it starts off with a high pitch and then as it goes away from you, it gets lower, that's the Doppler effect. If you've ever seen a swan uh, start moving, the, see these ripples right here? These are water waves, and they get kind of squished up. So the frequency gets higher, and the wavelengths get shorter. And that can be seen in this equation right here. This is the frequency, and this is the wavelength. And so they have an inverse relationship always. And that happens with all types of waves. You see uh, light waves, and water waves, and sound waves. Uh, what we did, our experiments were all with radar waves. Um, sorry, radio waves. Uh, and in radio waves, since they're electromagnetic, this B, this wave speed right here, is going to be C, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second in all of those. Our Doppler radar functions by using the Doppler effect. Uh, what we do in our Doppler radar, as you saw from the other group, what it looks like, those antennas, they shoot out uh, one continuous wave. So a continuous wave has a constant amplitude and a constant frequency. And that frequency, if it bounces off of a standing object and comes back, it's going to have the same frequency. It's not going to change. But if the frequency is different, that means that there's a relative velocity. <coughs> there. So if something's moving towards it, that frequency is going to get that wave is going to get squinched up, and so the frequency is going to be higher and the wavelength is going to be lower. Uh, we can calculate this using this equation right here. Uh, this is the difference in frequency. So this r is the it's the velocity, but it's the velocity in the radial direction. So right here, you can see, if something's moving towards or away from the radar, we're going to be able to pick it up. But if it's moving around the radar, if it's moving tangential to the radar, we're not going to be able to see what that is. That's what this cosine is for. That's, the, that's how we find the component of the velocity that's moving towards it or away from it. Now that we know a little bit about the Doppler radar and the Doppler effect, we can look at how it's, how it's been discovered and how it's implemented today. So the first time someone observed the Doppler effect, that's who it's named after, was Christian Andreas Doppler. He saw uh, the Doppler effect with light. He saw redshift right here. Redshift is a phenomenon where things like planets and things are, will move away from, are, are from us, from an observer, really fast. So, you know, red has the longest wavelength of light. So when it's moving away, that wave gets stretched out. And so the red, so it, it appears red to our eyes. Uh, and that same effect of redshift can, is still used by scientists today with one application of planetary motion. We can tell what galaxies are moving away from us. That same effect is also used by law enforcement and radar guns. That's how they catch speeding. And that's the same thing they do with detecting submarines. It's just propagating through water instead of air. It's also used in uh, biomedical applications like echocardiograms. Doppler echocardiograms have been used to see the movements in blood vessels and arteries. Uh, and another application is in weather. So that's how we see the velocities and wind speeds of different weather events. And David, who really likes weather, will explain further in the next slide. So as Elijah mentioned, one of the major applications of the Doppler radar is in weather. So how it works is that the Doppler radar will look for precipitation motion and then it will display it on the screen. And so by displaying it on the screen, it can show the speed of the storm motion, the speed of the winds inside the storm, and also the intensity of the precipitation. So this is a Doppler image of a hurricane that hit Texas. And this is a Doppler image of a tornadic storm. And so if you notice, there are two different modes. On the left is the precipitation mode. So here you can see how intense the precipitation is. So the redder it is, the more rain or whatever precipitation it is. And on the right, it's the velocity. So the brighter the colors of the velocity, of the red or green, the stronger the winds are. 
And red means winds going away from the radar, and green means winds coming towards the radar. So here, there's a tight green and red right here, and that basically means that's where the tornado is because the winds are moving in opposite directions, causing a little rotation where the storm is. And meteorologists will use this to warn tornadoes and different severe weather ahead of time. So there is current research being developed using the Dopplers. Uh, one, one application is the Dow, which is the Doppler on wheels. And they basically use the Dow, which is a Doppler radar on the mobile truck. And they bring it up close to various severe weather. And for example, a hurricane. This is a Hurricane Harvey, Harvey which hit tw in 2017 in Houston. And so when they drove it in, they realized that there were these little meso vortices. And these metal vortices is where the highest winds were. And so by understanding how they form and how they interact inside the major circu circulation, then we would be able to better prepare for such severe weather. This is a Doppler of a tornado that hit Magnum, Oklahoma this year. And this is of McCook, Nebraska tornado. And so by understanding this, we could better uh, increase safety and also increase warning time of such severe weather. So now that we got through some of the real life applications, we'll now be going into some of our controlled experiments. So the first experiment we did was of the moving car. So we wanted to test the idea of the radar gun. And how we did this was we set the radar on the sidewalk by the street and measured cars coming towards us. We had some trouble at the beginning because the feedback wasn't appearing. But after a couple of tries, we managed to get a car that was slowing to a stop in front of us. And this is a video. I even increased the sensitivity and everything. Well, that one was really good. We came right up to the point. The uh, a slowing car would better show the changing velocity. So as you can see, over time, which is the y-axis, the speed will decrease as it comes to a stop. And so our max velocity was around 2.5 meters per second or 5.6 miles an hour, which isn't too fast, but that's because the car was coming to a stop. And so these are our three different data graphs that we plotted. On the left is the distance versus time. On, in the middle is the velocity versus time. And in the right is the acceleration versus time. So starting off with the middle graph, you can see, like I mentioned before, that the velocity decreases as the time increases. And then we converted that to distance by basically taking the area of the curve. And we can use the formula down there, which is taking two consecutive velocity points, multiplying it by the time interval, and dividing it by two, which some of you may realize as the trapezoid formula. And then we also took the acceleration by taking two velocities next to each other, taking the difference, and dividing it by the time in between. So moving on to our second experiment, we wanted to measure the difference in velocities between two different types of motion of a ball. So for our first part of this experiment, um, with the pendulum, we swung a pendulum, a big metal ball, back and forth in front of our radar perpendicularly. And the second part, we turned our radar onto its back, and we threw a ball over it so we could accurately track its motions. So here is a video of our ball. Oh. So as you can see, we have okay, to turn our antenna upward so that it could accurately and um, it could accurately track the motion of the ball going over. So as you can see from these two data graphs, if you had no idea what we were doing, you would probably assume that these two balls had very similar motion patterns. But as but as contrary to the point, for the first graph, you will see that the highest points of velocity, those represent when the pendulum is at the minimum height. But for the ball toss, when the peaks of velocity actually represent when it's traveling towards the maximum height. So if, you, if you've ever thrown a ball, you know that it will travel up to this highest point, and it will stop, not stop, but it will like slow down, and then it'll come down to a stop. So that's why there's a divot in the speed. It's because as it reaches its highest point, it loses most of its velocity. But for the pendulum, the lowest points of velocity, or the divots, actually represent when the ball hits the sides of the swing. So for our final experiment, we decided to track, we tried to set to measure the motion of a ball floating in water. For this experiment, we, this, we filled our common room sink up to the brim with water, and we decided to put a ball in it, and we turned our radar towards it. For this experiment, we pushed the ball so it was submerged into the water and allowed it to bounce back up to regain equilibrium because of buoyant force. So in this graph, you will see the peak of velocity represents when the ball was fighting against the forces in the water to move upward and to float. And as the ball slowly bobbed and reached equilibrium, the speed was gradually decreased. By the end of the graph, you will see that that's actually just noise, um, noise created by um, reflections off of the water. 
And that concludes our experiments that we conducted this past two weeks. Now that we know what the Doppler factor Doppler shift is, and we know how it's included in radar, we can have a greater appreciation for the technology that we have today as a result of Doppler and the information that we can gather through different experimentation using the Doppler effect like we did in our four experiments here in these two weeks. And these are our sources. Um, before we go, we would like to give a shout out to George and then who gave the Doppler lecture and then Beverly who helped us a lot with his presentation. So thank you for your time. Is there any questions? How many of you were, were maybe exposed to these ideas before you came to LLRIs? Were you in any of the classes you had taken at school? Or, well, or was which ideas? We watched over Doppler in physics, but it was mostly just like a very brief introduction. We didn't learn any of the radar formulas, and we didn't learn anything related to kind of electromagnetic waves. Yes. Good question. So those radar assemblies that you guys made, did you guys, did you figure out like what the range is on them? Because I was wondering when you were doing the car experiment, you were saying that you were doing slower cars, if, if the radar assembly maybe wasn't strong enough to pick up the, the further, the ones that are further away or faster moving vehicles, I didn't know if that was played a part in it because they, you know, those assemblies seem small, so I didn't know what that Yeah, was. so as David said, it took a couple tries because we were first doing it on the side closest to our dorm, and we're trying to get cars on the opposite side of the road. And our what we the data that we collected wasn't all that great, so we repositioned ourselves. We very safely and lawfully crossed the road <laughs> and then set up again on the other side of the road. We were able to get better readings, and then that's how we actually got to the car that parked right in front of us. So the... Uh the Doppler data that you presented uh, was excellent, by the way, but it, it didn't fundamentally give you any indication of where the object that was moving was actually positioned relative to your radar, right? It only gave you velocity. Yeah. But the weather Doppler radars produce velocity, but, they, but it's actually at a position, right? Do you have any idea how the weather radars make that determination of where the velocity is actually happening? I think... Could it be, I think it could be using also the range of the Doppler and use, utilizing both to display it on the map. Um, I was wondering, you explained um, how it showed with the radar with the ball in the water. I was wondering why you decided to do that test compared to the others, like through the air and the car. Um. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, basically, we went to the lake at first, but then we realized that it was night. Like it's a river. A oh, river, yes. It's we the went, Charles River. We went to the river, but we couldn't really think of anything. But then uh, one of us was like, "Water plus ball. Let's put the let's push the ball into the water, and then that's where we got our idea." Yeah. Very simple logic. We wasn't there was there wasn't anything special behind that. Yes, Ray. Um, you showed a map of the wind <laughs> precipitation as well as, sorry, the wind speed as well as the precipitation directions. How does the radar know it's detecting wind versus water? I think it's detecting the motion of the water that is moving because of the wind. And so the, note, if you're like up high in the air, the water droplets will be moving based off of the wind and the wind patterns of it. And so I think there's some formula that can calculate the wind speed based off of that. Okay. Thank you for your time.